Five challenges of living in an Amish home as a non-Amish person. Now, these should not be taken in any way as complaints. That's not what this is about. This is simply a video to kind of point out some of the challenging aspects of life for someone who's not Amish and goes to live in an Amish home. So if you ever have that opportunity, you can kind of know what to expect. I've been fortunate enough to have Amish friends. One of the great kindnesses I've experienced is the hospitality that is regularly extended to me. And usually when I stay with the Amish, it's for a shorter stretch, like a week or so, but it can be longer than that. The longest time I've ever stayed with Amish friends is about two months. In that kind of period, you get a sense of kind of the rhythms of life uh, in a way that you don't get from just staying for a few days. First one, you got to say goodbye to some creature comforts. This kind of goes without saying, but you're not going to have the same amenities that you would have back at your home. And the first one, obviously, is electricity. You know, you're, you're going to have a moment when you walk into your room at night where you reach for the light switch and it's not going to be there, okay? And then you're like, oh yeah, I'm in an Amish home. There's no light switches here. You know, obviously you're not going to have the internet connection that you're used to, or at least not like a laptop. I mean, you can't plug in and charge your laptop if you need to be online a lot. Amish families that I've stayed with, my friends, they don't really, they don't get uptight about having a phone with you. Or, you know, I've, I used to have a Kindle that I would bring in that actually had like an internet connection or, you know, just a, just a smartphone. But, you know, I tend not to want to do that too often because that kind of defeats the purpose of staying with Amish friends. So rather than, you know, checking the internet in the morning, you might go downstairs and, and check out the, the newspaper. A lot of Amish do get newspapers. That's kind of an old fashioned aspect of staying with the Amish dead tree newspaper. So, you know, if you're staying with the Amish, you know, your clothes are not going to have that downy, fresh, you know, straight from the dryer softness because, you know, if they've been washed, they've probably been hung outside on the line and those kind of, they tend to kind of be more stiff and not so soft to the touch. When I've actually had to iron my clothes before, now they don't have an electric iron, but they have what's called a sad iron. It's a hunk of metal, right? So you heat it up on the stove, you have a grip that goes on it, and then you just kind of iron with that. I wasn't very good at it. Uh, you got to be careful not to burn your fingers. If there's no microwave, you might not get as many showers as you'd be used to at home. That's kind of been my experience, either because I'm just too tired at the end of the day or just maybe not as convenient. You know, the Amish I stay with do have bathrooms. They do have running water. Uh, the very plainest Amish don't have those things. So you're probably pretty rarely going to get a shower if you stay in one of those homes. With large Amish families, the bathroom isn't necessarily always as available as it might be. So none of these things are surprising, but you got to get used to having a lower level of technology and less of the comforts that you may be used to at home. Number two, lighting can be tricky. And I've already talked about this a little bit. So you kind of got to have a, a, a battery powered flashlight or light of some sort with you at night. Many Amish use those. Now, if you're in the very plainest Amish homes, they may use even like an oil lamp. Generally, the Amish I've stayed with, they use these kind of DeWalt lights, which are pretty handy and actually can put out some pretty bright light. Things like brushing your teeth or washing up at night may require you to point the flashlight at just the right angle. If you want to read at night, you know, you got to make sure the batteries are charged. I've often been reading, like I'll read like a, a Family Life, which is an Amish publication. I'll have like the batteries just kind of going out on me. So I'll get 10, 15 minutes of reading and then well, I guess it's time to go to sleep. So many Amish are using this natural gas or propane lighting and that, that burns quite bright, but it also burns very hot. I mean, it's nice in the winter, but if it's in the like hot summer, I get pretty dehydrated sometimes in an Amish living room. Uh, you know, sometimes we'll be playing like a board game or something at the table. I always kind of hope that I'm not going to be sitting near the light because it always you know, just cooks you there. So I kind of like to be on the opposite side of the table and they burn so hot. In theory, they're quite dangerous because you don't want to, you know, you definitely don't want to touch one of those. Some of them have covers around them, like glass kind of shield. You know, sometimes they're just open. You know, with the lighting too, you know, you kind of naturally start to align your body clock. Like if you're a night person, I mean, you're going to tend to be staying up not not so late and getting up earlier. I guess like the Amish do, start to align your body clock with the more the natural rhythms of the day. Number three, you might find yourself short on sleep. At least me personally, I found that sleep can be a challenge when I'm staying with Amish friends. That could be because of the rooster that's crowing outside my window. It 
four or five or whatever time that's not wake up time, depending on what type of home you're staying in. Now, Amish farmers typically get up at like 4 a.m. to go do the first milking. But even if you're not staying with a farm family, Amish families tend to wake up early. So, you know, your breakfast may be like six something, seven. So you may find yourself needing a nap. Another thing that wakes me up when I'm staying with Amish friends is the clock. <laughs> and Amish homes typically have like, they could have like a musical clock or a grandfather clock or clocks that make noise and make they have chimes. And uh, those tend to wake me up. I guess Amish owners of those clocks get used to them, but it's hard for me to do that. So I, I typically sleep with earplugs anyway. In general, you could probably expect to get less sleep. And even with waking up early, I found that some Amish folks like to stay up late at night as well, too. So it could be the could be the farmer's schedule. You know, if you early wake up, but you have your kind of farmer's nap in the afternoon, it takes a little bit of adjustment to get used to the schedule, and you might find yourself a little short on slumber if you stay with the Amish. So number four, you'll have less downtime. So if you're an introvert and you like to spend a lot of time alone, staying with an Amish family could be difficult for you because... Amish tend to have big families. So if you're in a household of five, six, eight children, and you've got other families that live nearby and visitors, and you know, there's usually a lot going on in Amish homes. Visiting is something the Amish do face-to-face, -face, in person. You get to talk to people, and that's great. But if you find yourself needing some downtime, it's a little bit harder to come by. And especially if you are a guest, if you're a non-Amish, if you're an English guest there in an Amish home, there's a lot of people there, there's just one you, right? A lot of times people might be curious about your life, which is really, you know, for me, it's, I don't know if you say flattering or it's just, it's very nice to get a lot of attention, but sometimes people are, you know, you, you, you answer sometimes a lot of the same questions when you talk to some of the family members and the uncles and the cousins and, and everyone. You know, I'm from North Carolina. People ask me, oh, what's it like in North Carolina? You know, what's the farming like? Those kinds of things. And again, not a complaint. It's just that something to adjust to. So number five, you may become the default Amish taxi. Now, I want to be really careful how I say this because driving Amish friends is actually something I really enjoy. So this could actually kind of go on my list of favorite things about staying with Amish friends. And Amish, first of all, Amish taxi, well, that's kind of the term for someone who drives the Amish. Now, the Amish will sometimes pay or often pay people who do this uh, for a living, driving Amish to the store or to visit relatives in another part of the community or even another state. Amish people tend to really value the ability to, you know, like if you need a ride to the hardware store, it's a lot easier to do that. If, if there's a driver there available, it's a lot faster, a lot more convenient. You don't have to hitch up the horse and buggy. You know, you may have to haul something that doesn't really fit that well in a horse and buggy, but would in a car. So you may be politely asked to give someone a ride. For me, it's kind of a way of repaying the kindness of being allowed to stay in their home. And, and typically, I also should say that when I've driven Amish they've often offered to pay me for it, even though I'm kind of staying with the family. So that's, uh, you know, to their credit as well. So I put this on my list of hardest things of living with the Amish because often you'll find the logistics are difficult because if you're driving somewhere, like if you're driving to another family member's place, well, it often happens that a lot of people want to go with you because that's kind of fun. That's neat. They want to go see their sister or their uncle or their cousin or whoever it is. Sometimes I remember I had a, I drove a pickup truck for a while and it was kind of hard to squeeze people in that. I mean, it was an extended cab, but it was just a Ford Ranger. So we have, I remember when I was going to pick up uh, some Amish friend's family and uh, it was, I think, just supposed to be two or three people. And I think I ended up hauling six or seven people in, <laughs> in the truck. So I had two or three or four in the in the front, I had three in the back, in the uh, in the bed. Other times, I've had like a rental car, and then like a friend might ask me to go help him pick something up from the uh, hardware store or wherever. I think one time we had to bring back some really long like tarp. That was a, just a super long roll. We had to be pretty creative with that rental car to get it to fit in there. I think we had to drop the back seat and slide it through the trunk up through the front. I mean, it was <laughs> it was fun. So, so I've actually hauled some pretty interesting. Uh, things as uh, as an Amish taxi. But I really enjoy, enjoy this too because it's a great way, like you drive through the community and, you know, when you're 
driving your Amish friends, they know a lot of people in the community, they know a lot of things about the community, so it's a great way to learn about the area, and I've had some really good conversations with my Amish friends as I've served as the Amish taxi. So that's my list of five hardest things. What about the best things about living with the Amish? Now, I'll be doing a video about that, and I'll put a link to it here when it's ready. I'm putting out two videos per week. If you enjoyed this video, do me a favor, give it a quick like. Thanks. See you next time. You know, they don't have YouTube channels, but if they did, uh, they might be able to make a video about, say, the five hardest things about having an English house guest.